there's climate change in the pipeline in addition to the warming that has already occurred. This is the challenge of our time. And it is our responsibility to leave this world a better place than we found it. We know from lived experience that the amount we have already warmed the globe is too much. We are already living the era of dangerous warming. When the scientific community tells us this is the planetary crisis of our time, This movie is about taking decisive action to fix the climate. Invest 20 minutes of your time to find out how we together can bring about a solution to global warming. After this video, you will know how you in a simple manner can start solving the climate change problem. But first things first, you need to understand why it is imperative that we act now. This is a carbon atom. The amount of carbon on Earth has remained the same throughout the ages. Carbon is part of every organic molecule. It exists in plants, it exists in animals, it exists in humans. For billions of years, the carbon has moved around between plants, creatures, the atmosphere, the ocean, sediments, soil, in what we call the carbon cycle. When in the atmosphere, Carbon takes the form of carbon dioxide. Now, carbon dioxide has the ability to absorb energy in the form of infrared radiation and to shortly thereafter disperse that same energy in a random direction. So, what you see here is the sun's radiation passing through our atmosphere and being absorbed by the ground. When emitted, the energy has a different wavelength. It is now infrared radiation, also known as heat. If the infrared radiation hits a carbon dioxide molecule on its way up, the heat is temporarily trapped on Earth, and temperatures on Earth are kept up. But the more carbon dioxide we have in our atmosphere, the more heat is trapped. And the more heat is trapped, the more temperature increases. The amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is measured as ppm, or parts per million. Throughout Earth's history, the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere has varied, and as it has changed, so have the living conditions on our planet. The last 500,000 years, the concentrations have varied between 190 parts per million and 300 parts per million. It's been moving up and down in a rather distinct pattern every 100,000 years or so. Every time the concentrations of greenhouse gases have decreased, it has become colder and water has amassed in the form of ice, creating a new ice age and lowering the sea levels. And after tens of thousands of years of ice age, the greenhouse gas levels have increased, trapping more of the heat, melting much of the ice and increasing sea levels again, thus creating an interglacial period. Our own civilization came into being during the last interglacial period in which we are still today. And we lived with a greenhouse gas concentration of 280 parts per million until we realized that we can dig and pump up fossil fuels and burn and combust them to extract energy, emitting greenhouse gases in the process. What has happened since then is unique in the history of the Earth. Not in 10,000 years. Not in 1,000 years. But in 100 measly years, which is so little that you can hardly distinguish them on the axis, we have increased CO2 concentrations from 280 parts per million to 400 parts per million. It is insane. It is a amount larger than it took for the Earth to melt ice age after ice age after ice age. Now understand this. When the ice is melted 300,000 years ago, sea levels increased 30 meters or 100 feet. When the ice is melted 200,000 years ago, sea levels increased 20 meters or 66 feet. 100,000 years ago, sea levels increased 30 meters or 100 feet. And 10,000 years ago, 
Sea levels increased 30 meters or 100 feet. And that is the sea level at which our own civilization came into being. So what happens now? Take into account the following facts. 1. The current increase of 120 parts per million is larger than any of the latest increases, and they all melted ice ages. 2. There is plenty of ice left on the Earth that is currently melting. So now ask yourself, why should we expect any less from our own increase of greenhouse gas emissions? We are at the beginning of a tragedy that will unfold during the next two to three hundred years, and it has already started. Scientists agree that temperatures have been increasing steadily across the globe. The last ten years have been the hottest on record. The summer of 2015 was no exception. In India, a heat wave killed more than 2,300 people. In Pakistan, a heat wave claimed more than 1,000 lives. And several countries in Europe, including Spain, Germany, France and the Netherlands, saw new temperature records. The last decade, chronic droughts in western North America have left dying forests and depleted river basins. These droughts have been the strongest in 800 years. The drought situation in California is so severe that it has led to water rationing. In North Africa, temperatures rose by an average of 1 degree Celsius during the first decade this century. Droughts, which previously occurred once every 10 years, now occur every other year. In 2011, East Africa suffered a severe drought, which killed between 50,000 and 250,000 people. Right now, some 75 to 250 million people in Africa are at risk of greater water stress. At the same time, ice is melting at astonishing speeds across the Earth. The Greenland ice sheet has lost over 1,000 gigatons of mass the last decade. That is the equivalent of almost 3 million Empire State buildings dumped straight into the ocean. The point where the Jakobshavn glacier calves into the sea reduced more than 40 kilometers between 1850 and 2006. And there are roughly 200,000 glaciers worldwide, and most of them are melting. Researchers concluded that the Earth lost a total of 4.3 trillion tons of ice between 2003 and 2010. And as a result, global sea levels are increasing. During this century, living conditions will only get worse for our species. We can no longer stop the West Antarctic ice sheet from melting completely. Glaciers will keep melting. Droughts will be more severe and more frequent. The droughts we are experiencing today, well, they will pale in comparison. By mid-century, some 350 to 600 million people in Africa will be at risk of greater water stress. More crops will go to waste. Initial projections that were made in the late 90s pointed to a sea level rise of 1 to 4 feet, or approximately 1 meter this century. As time passed, however, satellite observations of sea levels showed that reality traced the upper bands of those projections. As we have gained more knowledge about our climate, oceans, ice melt and sea level rise, new models and projections have been conceived that argue that sea levels will rise this century by somewhere between 2 to 6 feet, approximately 1 to 2 meters. And now, the latest study by Dr. James Hansen, the father of climate change awareness, and 16 co-authors who all have impressive merit in their academic fields, present findings that show that oceans could rise even faster this century, as much as 10 feet, or 3 meters, in the next 50 years. Regardless of if sea levels rise 1 meter, 2 meters, or 3 meters this century, the impact on our coastal cities and communities will be massive. Just look at flooding in New York at the end of the century when sea levels increase 1 meter, 2 meters, and 3 meters. The fate of Miami will be far worse when sea levels increase 1 meter, 2 meters, and 3 meters. 
A similar fate will befall Amsterdam when sea levels increase 1 meter, 2 meters, and 3 meters. The same thing will happen in Mumbai, it'll happen in Shanghai, and the list of cities goes on and on and on. All this, we are already more or less guaranteed. There is no way of stopping it. It will come. Expect it. Prepare for it. And that is this century. But what really gets me worried is the next century. And I am terrified by the century after that. You see, on our planet, there are systems referred to as natural feedback systems. You have already seen these systems at work in this chart, remember? These changes were created by feedback systems. Allow me to give you two examples of feedback systems. The first feedback loop that we need to be aware of is the ice albedo feedback. The word albedo derives from Latin. It means whiteness or reflected sunlight. This is how it works. Bright white snow and ice reflect sunlight back into space. Since the reflected energy maintains its wavelength, it is therefore not absorbed by the CO2 in our atmosphere. Thus, no heating takes place. However, as the planet warms up due to global warming, snow and ice melts, and the reflective surface diminishes. So the whiteness of the planet, the albedo, or the planet's ability to reflect sunlight, decreases. Where there was once white snow and ice, there is now land and dark ocean, which now absorbs the sun's energy and emits infrared radiation. This energy contributes to the heating of our planet, which in turn melts more ice, which in turn leads to more absorption of energy, which brings more heating, and that in turn melts even more ice. The second feedback system is the methane trapped in permafrost in the Arctic regions. The northern systems hold massive amounts of methane trapped in permafrost. The thing with methane is that it's 20 times more potent than carbon dioxide for trapping atmospheric heat. So it's a very good thing that the permafrost keeps the methane trapped in ice. But as temperatures increase, the permafrost begins to thaw and as it melts, the methane is freed and escapes into the atmosphere, where it contributes to the trapping of more heat. This, in turn, increases temperatures, thawing more permafrost, releasing more methane, trapping even more heat, and driving up temperatures further. And this causes more thawing, causing more release of methane, and driving temperatures up higher and higher and higher. These were just two examples of feedback systems on our planet. There are plenty more. What we must avoid at all costs is to reach a point in time, somewhere in the near future, when we have emitted enough greenhouse gases to increase the temperature to such a level that the feedback systems absorb so much heat and emit so much greenhouse gases on their own that they become self-sustaining. This point is called a tipping point, or the point of no return, because after this point it will not matter what we do, even if we shut down all man-made greenhouse gas emissions it'll be too late. These systems will be self-sustaining by then, and they will quickly change our climate until they reach a new stable state. What this means for our planet is the following. Greenhouse gas concentrations will keep increasing. The planet will get increasingly hotter and hotter. Ice sheets and glaciers will keep melting. Sea levels will increase while humanity can only helplessly watch. And when all ice has melted, the sea level will have increased 70 meters, 200 feet. The equatorial and subtropical regions will be largely uninhabitable due to drought and extreme heat and large parts of the remaining land will not be suitable to grow crops. Humanity will be cornered and crowded on contracting patches of land with diminishing food production. And how we behave when faced with lack of resources, you only need to look up in the history books. 
So where is the tipping point? Well, nobody knows. Most scientists agree that we need to stop global warming below 2 degrees Celsius to avoid the tipping point. But here's the thing. Because global warming comes with a 40 year delay, we are already guaranteed 1.6 degrees of warming. And we are still burning fossil fuels on a massive scale and increasing greenhouse gas concentrations, which guarantees us even more warming. So the margin is extremely thin. And after the climate saving pledges by our diplomats at the COP21 Paris summit, the best we can get seems to be 2.6 degrees of warming which will most likely push us beyond the tipping point. So, now would be a good time for us to collectively wake up and realize that our politicians have not gone far enough. And the free market is not embracing renewables fast enough to avoid a catastrophe. Now you know how dire the situation is for us humans, and how little time we have to fix our climate. Ironically, while we go to extreme extents to drill and mine for fuel that eventually will see the end of us, each year the Earth's surface receives 20,000 times more energy from the Sun than the total energy need of humanity. Or in other words, if we were to harvest the energy from less than 0.5% of our deserts, we would cover our energy needs. I want us all, and I do mean everyone, to collectively pledge 100 million dollars so that we together can build a massive solar plant. We will build it in a region that is rich on sunshine, in a country where it will offset as much fossil fuel emissions as possible. The solar plant will sell electricity like any other power plant, and create revenue like any other power plant. But our plant will not have any interest payments on debt to pay, nor any debt to pay off. Nor will it have any investors who expect dividends and claim equity. So at the end of the year, it will have made a profit. We will use that profit. And in combination with more pledges, we will build two additional solar plants. Now we will have three plants that generate a nice profit. That profit, with more pledges, will build us three new plants. We will keep pledging more money and we will keep reinvesting profit. And once we have that momentum, we will not stop. We cannot stop until the combined efforts of our governments, any privately held plants and the plants held by the Helios Initiative have achieved a world with zero emissions from electricity production. And it will have to begin with one plant. But as you understand, 100 million dollars is only enough to build one major solar plant. It isn't enough to end greenhouse gas emissions, not by far. Nor will a billion dollars be. Or ten billion. Or a hundred billion dollars for that matter. In fact, not even a trillion dollars will be enough. The truth is that in order to stop greenhouse gas emissions from electricity production, humanity will need to invest somewhere around six trillion dollars. The sooner, the better. Six trillion dollars will buy 60,000 solar plants with 100 megawatts capacity each. And you know what? We don't have a lot of time to build them. Some of this capacity will be built by our governments, some by corporations, and some by individual households. So let's assume that the gap we need to fill will cost around two trillion dollars. It's an astronomical figure, but nowhere near impossible. Let's put that into more relevant numbers. If we were to divide two trillion dollars between the 100 million richest adults in the world, each of them would need to invest twenty thousand dollars or $2,000 per year during 10 years. If we instead were to divide $2 trillion between the 500 richest adults in the world, each of them would need to invest $4,000 or $400 per year during 10 years. That is completely doable. Finally, if we were to divide $2 trillion amongst all adults living on this planet, each and every one would need to invest $400 or $40 per year during 10 years. The problem is 
that half the world's population are very poor and do not have this money to spare. Well, we have the possibility to do something about that. As you know by now, our first objective is to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions from electricity production. But we have a second objective as well. Who do you think will own all these plants? Well, they sure won't belong to me. And they won't just belong to the people who contributed to the Helios initiative. These plants will belong to every living, breeding adult human being on this planet. They will belong to everyone, regardless if they contribute or not, regardless of beliefs, regardless of ethnicity, social class, education, they will belong to everyone. The people of the world will own the plants via the Atlas clan. A Swedish non-profit association strictly guided by its statutes. The Atlas clan will control all the stock in the Helios Initiative company, which in turn will own the plants. Anyone on Earth who wishes to be part of the decisions made by the Atlas clan will be able to join as a member, and through your membership you will be able to vote in matters concerning the Atlas clan and the Helios Initiative company. And when we can pride ourselves of having built a network of solar plants together that belongs to the people of Earth, that produces green energy across the globe, and when greenhouse gas emissions are no more threatening our world, then our children and grandchildren can vote on how much of the profit will be paid out on a yearly or monthly basis, equally to each and every living, breeding, adult individual on this planet. Imagine how that would thwart poverty, hunger, and thirst. And all the suffering that is a systemic result of poverty. Imagine how that instead would promote equality and happiness. That is our second objective. This is the kind of future we should leave for our children. And now you know how close we are to destroying our world and the future of our children. That our politicians, diplomats and the free market are not doing enough to stave off the upcoming catastrophe. And you know how little time we have to fix the problem. But you have a choice, because ultimately, we are the people on this earth. And because we also know that together we can actually stop climate change before it's too late.